Hello, everyone. Once again, my name is Amherst Williams. I'm the executive director of the Connecticut League of History Organizations. And I am so pleased that um, we're partnering today with the Florence Griswold Museum to help bring you this year's Samuel Thorne Memorial Lecture. Um, for those of you who aren't familiar with the League, um, the Connecticut League of History Organizations uh, was established in 1950. And for 70 years, we have been Connecticut's uh, history and heritage community support network, um, providing training, resources, opportunities to meet and connect um, for all those who share the materials and resources and stories of our state's past. Um, we are pleased to have the Florence Griswold Museum as members of CLHO. Um, and we're really happy to be um, helping to bring this wonderful event to you on this very exciting and historic day. Um, before we begin, uh, I just wanted to say a couple of things. I will be using the chat to um, moderate the question and answer um, once our presenter is finished with his presentation. So take a moment to locate the chat feature in Zoom if you haven't done so already. Um, and uh, with no further ado, um, I'd like to hand things over to Becky Beaulieu. Thanks, Amaris. Uh, good, good evening, everyone. I'm Becky Bollier, director of Florence Griswold Museum. Welcome to our first virtual Samuel Thorne Memorial Lecture, which we are able to offer along with our friends at CLHO. This fall lecture has been a tradition at the museum since 1995 and is designed to bring a noted scholar of American culture to Old Lyme and is offered free of charge to members and neighbors of the museum. The Thorne Lecture was conceptualized not to be directly linked necessarily to the museum's exhibitions, to provide an additional educational offering that is supplementary. In the past, topics have ranged from Grant Wood's American Gothic with art historian Wanda Korn to the naturalist Alexander von Humboldt with noted British author Andrea Wolfe. However, this year our choice of speakers dovetails beautifully with what we are calling the Year of Alternative Voices at the Museum. Through our exhibitions this year, we have been able to incorporate outside perspectives and new insights on our collection using a methodology that propels new thinking and ways of working as we grapple with making museum relevant to a diverse audience. Tonight's speaker, Randy Griffey, is the curator of modern and contemporary art at the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York. Randy has worked at the Met for the last seven years. He holds a PhD in American art for the University of Kansas and his curatorial work has encompassed attention to the art of Thomas Hart Benton, Hans Hoffman, Marsden Hartley, and most recently, Jacob Lawrence. For this Thorne lecture, we asked him to discuss his recent work on the commission of Cree artist Kent Monkman's The Wooden Boat People, completed in 2019. This commission has resulted in a monumental diptych that explores themes of colonization, immigration, loss, and resilience through the lens of the indigenous people. The Met recently announced their decision to acquire the painting for their permanent collection, and we hope you'll be able to see it. But until that point, we look forward to being introduced by Randy. Thank you so much for joining us. And Randy, I'm gonna turn it over to you. Great, thanks so much. Thank you, Becky, and um, um, thank you to everyone uh, involved in tonight's gathering, um, including David, who I think maybe made the initial outreach um, and expressed interest in this topic. And I'm super gratified to present this uh, project to all of you. Um, thank you for your interest in it. Um, I actually have to say, given what transpired today, I was wondering if anyone would show up, if <laughs> this was still gonna be you know, um, on people's minds, but um, I'm glad to see such a robust turnout and um, uh, really happy that this, this project continues to really resonate and has a slightly longer lifespan than, than we thought originally. Um, as you can see here on the, um, the, landing, the landing page uh, for the project, we originally thought we would close in April but of course, the project didn't close in April. The museum was closed in April. So uh, the, the paintings are still in place. Uh, I'll, I'll give a sense of sort of their uh, next steps, um, maybe toward the end of the, of the talk. But um, just thank you for uh, your interest tonight. I wish I could be there in person. Um, and thank you for your support of 
the Griswold, um, you know, uh, stating the obvious, uh, these cultural institutions uh, under these conditions are really uh, struggling in many, many instances. So your support of um, the museum there is, is really critical. And I really encourage you to do whatever you can to, to help uh, through this, this difficult period. So um, pleased to give you a kind of um, uh, a primer, I guess, to some extent, and maybe some of you have come through. Uh, it, we opened in December, so perhaps uh, some people tuning in happened to see them before we closed in, in March. Uh, but I'm going to give you kind of the backstory of this commission because big projects like this don't come out of thin air, of course, as I'm sure you realize. Um, and uh, we're going to go into, you know, big picture, but also uh, quite literally into some of the amazing details uh, of, of this work, both uh, literal details and proverbial um, details. So just a little bit about Kent. Um, Kent is an artist that may not be terribly familiar to you, although maybe there, there's a greater chance of, of that familiarity now that um, this project opened and um, I think his profile has expanded a bit. Um, but um, as Becky said, uh, Kent uh, is a resident of Canada uh, and descended from Cree um, from, on his maternal grandmother's side. Um, and I mean, one of them, we wanted to work with Kent for a whole range of reasons that I'll get into. Um, but uh, the larger backstory there was that um, our newish, although not so new now, but uh, director Max Holine uh, came on board um, in, dis in the summer of 2018. And his um, um, appointment was accompanied by a new round, a new spate of commissions, annual commissions by contemporary artists responding to the Met's collection, responding to the Met's spaces. Um, and I had been wanting to look, I'd been looking for an opportunity to work with Kent. Uh, and it turned out that the Great Hall Commission just kind of landed perfectly as the opportunity to work with Kent for reasons, again, I'll, I'll get into. Um, Kent uh, originally came on my radar in the context of planning for uh, an exhibition uh, called The Plains Indians, Plains, Plains Indians, uh, Artists of Earth and Sky, uh, because the, the Met was adding a modern and contemporary section to that traveling exhibition, which uh, stopped chronologically really around 1920 or so. And the Met did not want to mount the show and give the impression that Plains Indian culture uh, had, had no contemporary touchstone or, or you know, life. So um, we were considering Kent in that context, um, but he uh, did not in the end make the final cut, which disappointed me. Uh, and, but then it also planted the seed that we needed to work with him in some capacity. Um, and one reason we wanted to work with him is that the, the Met is particularly um, inclined to work with um, contemporary artists who are engaged in the history of art, uh, because uh, we have the context of those historic collections to provide the connection, the context for artists like Carrie James Marshall or any number of others who are really mining the, the history of, of art history uh, and can't really, really um, uh, fit that bill. Um, we also have been trying to um, expand um, indigenous uh, narratives in the, the museum. Uh, you may know that the, the American Wing now features um, the uh, named Diker Collection of Native American Art uh, on the first floor of the American Wing. So, you know, better late than never, but there's finally Native American art in the American Wing at the Met. And so this uh, commission was also an opportunity to expand on uh, the American Wing um, uh, presentation to show uh, in issues around indigeneity, experience, identity, uh, et cetera, in, uh, in, the, in the contemporary art uh, and in this very, very prominent and symbolic space of the Great Hall. Um, so um, I, again, I, I'm of course, I'm, I'm not unbiased and super proud of this project, but also this was a bit out of the box for the Met. Uh, because uh, New, uh, New York was not his, uh, he doesn't live in New York, he doesn't even have New York gallery representation, um, and has really uh, made a career for himself outside of the uh, kind of um, network of the New York gallery system. 
so I, I've always appreciated how, in a way, that this project was very out of the box for the Met and, and very, very bold, uh, even daring in certain ways that, that I, again, I'm very proud of, I will confess. Um, so one of the um, ways in which I really became interested in Kent was learning that he early on uh, was an abstract artist. Um, he was uh, went through graduate school and be, uh, as a young younger artist had really um, uh, I don't <laughs> drinking the Kool Aid is a little bit um, maybe inappropriate, but you know he had really um, absorbed the gospel of abstraction as pure art. Um, and um, at a certain point, however, near the the death of his grandmother, I mentioned before. Uh, his art really changed um, dramatically away uh, from abstraction and toward this um, unapologetically figurative um, um, academic kind of figurative style that, that he's become known for. Uh, and that had very much to do with the fact that um, uh, in her last stages of life, Kent's grandmother started um, sharing a little bit more about her life. Um, and um, and she had endured um, the Canadian residential school system, uh, which you may or may not know. This was something I didn't know, but um, the, it's a re uh, religiously affiliated national school system that has, was uh, basically part of the colonial project um, of New France eventually, um, in that, um, that basically is a system in place through these schools to um, to civilize the, the, the indigenous people of what we now know as Canada. Um, and this is a great cultural reckoning even today in Canada uh, because of the loss of language and custom and stories and culture. So, um, and then Kent, who always harbored a love of like what we think of as canonical art history of Western and American art history, um, uh, started to devote himself to reinserting and to, in, in, into inserting indigenous narratives into the kind of grand manner, the grand master narrative of Western American art. So using the language in the sense of especially academic uh, and history painting to uh, really propel uh, uh, indigenous uh, narratives, uh, experiences and identities, uh, basically um, authorize using this um, revered language of European academic and history painting to um, exalt these narratives that had been really um, uh, uh, obscured uh, or and or eliminated. A bit more backstory that I actually haven't shared that much, um, uh, which is a bit, I guess, more personal, was that the first time I went to the Met, um, and keeping in mind I didn't really grow up around here, so it, it took took a while for me to get to the Met, which so my first trip to the Met really wasn't until maybe 1990 when I was starting graduate school at, at, at KU. Um, when I first arrived in that great hall, this was one of the things I saw, um, which is um, Pierre Auguste caught um, the, the storm 1980. So this very traditional French academic uh, painting uh, um, ba basically caught, I think was a kind of a lesser like William Adolphe Bouguereau. I mean, he's sort of in that orbit. Um, but this was hanging prominently in the Great Hall. And for that reason, I've always associated Great Hall, the Great Hall with this kind of, this kind of work. Tapestries have hung in there. Um, other kinds of art have hung over time. Uh, I suspect uh, visitors on the call tonight have remember seeing a whole range of, of different things in there. Um, not too much contemporary art though. Um, often, you know, pretty traditional work like this. But then I remembered um, that Kent had already um, made reference to this painting. Uh, again, the first painting I remember seeing in the Great Hall in this uh, work from 2004, The Impending Storm. And it's a little hard maybe to make out from where you are, but he has shrunk the couple that's fleeing the storm uh, and they're in the lower left-hand corner. Um, and here, of course, the storm has, is, um, uh, meant to be very allegorical about, I think, a, com a coming genocide uh, for indigenous people as a result of European colonization. Um, but also in this case, the female figure that's in the 1880 storm has been replaced um, by um, Kent's alter ego, 
mischief egotistical who appears really prominently in, in the Mets um, diptych. Uh, and we'll talk more about mischief and you'll actually see mischief in action in just a minute. Um, but even more prominently, I knew that Kent had made really powerful direct reference to this Bierstadt, um, Landers Peak in the Mets collection in Die Indiana uh, from 2014 uh, here. And Kent went through a period of, of um, not only making reference to and engaging with the history of French academic painting, but also uh, what we think of as sort of Hudson River School or second generation Hudson River School like Bierstadt in these, these operatic um, Western landscapes, which often seem uh, so empty. Uh, so when Kent talks about this kind of work, he talks about this kind of work uh, by Bierstadt and others as um, giving a kind of permission to uh, move into um, this landscape, that, that it's a landscape that's empty, that is, an invi that is inviting um, colonization. And so when his work, um, like one of our paintings seems kind of overstuffed with figures, um, it's meant to be a kind of response to the, um, the vastness and the emptiness of works like this by Bierstadt. So there's this um, installation view, which I have to say still kind of takes my breath away. Again, but again, I, I know that I'm not without bias um, here. Um, so um, as Becky said, the, the commission uh, with Kent um, culminated with these two monumental paintings that are intended as a diptych, uh, a sort of before and after scenario uh, in broad strokes. Uh, and we'll get into individual uh, paintings in a, in a few minutes, but I wanna actually give, um, uh, oh, here's a quick view of both. So the first is the one on the left is welcoming the newcomers. Uh, we're gonna just take a quick look uh, and then come back in a minute to talk uh, a little more in depth. And then resurgence of the people uh, which is the painting uh, on the right of the doors, as you saw in that uh, installation view. So uh, we'll come back to these, but um, for the moment, I want to uh, give Kent the opportunity to also introduce this uh, body of work to you and just to hear the artist's voice speak for himself. My name's Kent Monkman, I'm a Cree artist. This is a very exciting opportunity to work with the collection of the Met because at this point in history, the Met is opening their doors to artists from different ethnicities and perspectives to be able to reflect, at least as an Indigenous person, what this colonial history has meant to us. As an artist, I wanted to bring Indigenous experience into this canon of art history. My inspiration comes from a variety of different sources. I'll be looking at old paintings. I'll be thinking about contemporary experiences. I love the language of painting. How does a painter describe grief? How does a painter describe ecstasy? How do they describe human emotion? I really believe in the power of painting. And through the collaboration with my assistants, we developed a process to create compositions from the initial pencil sketch, we start to identify who the characters are. We then move into a photography stage. We brought models in and created a photo shoot. We then moved to canvas. And then eventually it's just me left on the canvas by myself. That's when I really pull everything all together. And something that I've been looking at in my art practice for many years are the paintings or sculptures made by the settler artists who were looking at Indigenous people. And it's always this romantic view of the vanishing race. In fact, we're very much alive. My work really is refuting those themes of disappearance. There's elements of camp in my work. There's elements of Indigenous history. When I created Miss Chief Eagle Testicle, I wanted an artistic persona that could travel through time to reverse the gaze and look back at European settlers that could really speak to create values. We had our own ideas of gender and sexuality that didn't fit the male-female binary. Miss Chief is a legendary being. She really embodies a sense of humor, a playfulness, a relationship to mythologies and history. 
we have a lot of humor in our stories and mischief allows me to bring the humor even through some very dark chapters of our experience looking at the emmanuel Leitza painting washington crossing the delaware he's the hero of that painting and i wanted mischief to be the hero of my two paintings I wanted to make a monumental painting that really reflected on Indigenous perspective to give it that same importance. The title of this exhibition is Mistigosuak, the wooden boat people, which is a Cree word to describe when the French arrived, they arrived in wooden boats. The two paintings together really speak about the arrivals and migrations and displacements of people around the world. And the Great Hall is this place of people entering and people leaving. The left painting, welcoming the newcomers, the mischief is literally bending over to assist people arriving uh, to North America. That has to do with generosity. In the second painting, Resurgence of the People, mischief is commanding this boat, which looks a lot like a, a migrant vessel. And many people across the world are being displaced from their own lands. Mischief is leading this resurgence of the people to represent a return to our languages and a return to our traditions. I love the capacity for painting to tell a story. I've always been drawn to history painting because so many Indigenous experiences were never portrayed. This was an opportunity to engage with this master narrative, to reflect on it, and to offer perspectives that come from the outside. And um, the, the second short video gets a bit more into process. And I just think Kent's process is so fascinating. And especially if we have artists um, tuning in, uh, hopefully this will be especially interesting to you all. Um, and also just Kent is so good about talking about his own work that um, I find some of these videos to be pretty irresistible. After I absorbed all of that material, I started to work on sketches, you know, that stage where I started to really composite all of the different ideas and themes and stitch the references to the different works together. And what I do here in my studio with my team is we go through each composition, through each drawing, and decide who each character is. We identify who all the characters are. And then we set about on a, on a process to cast all of the different models that we bring in and they're costumed and then we shoot digital photographs. One of the advantages is that I have control over every aspect of this composition. Costumes are carefully selected, they're styled in a very specific way. And so I, my eye is on this entire process and as I give the, these images to the painters, I, I can be assured that you know they have exactly what I had in mind in terms of the vision for the piece. I found that the painters that I admire, there was a process, there are stages to getting to that large scale painting. The idea is to really work through all your compositional issues on a smaller scale. And by the time you get to the big painting, you have a roadmap. It's like having a really strong plan to, to get to your final composition. The Great Hall is so vast that in order to really hold that space, the paintings had to be huge. I have about 18 assistants that cover a broad range of jobs and responsibilities in my studio from administrative work all the way up to you know painting and fabrication. Your career is only going to advance as far as the amount of work that you can produce and the quality of work. So it was a way to enable myself to create more of the work that I wanted to create and to be more efficient at disseminating the work. It actually frees up my time for the creative part of what this is all about. The very core of this, this is about thinking about the ideas, the themes. It's incredible to collaborate with other artists, to have 18 other minds and hands all assisting means that the end result is, is greater because of the collaboration. So yeah, the, the, uh, the second video um, I like because it is, um, focused about the very collaborative nature of his, um, of his studio. Um, and, um, and it highlights the fact that his studio practice is based on a very kind of old master atelier um, scenario where um, 
uh, he's working with a team of trained assistants um, who are, you know, there's a kind of division of labor um, there. So, um, so what we'll do is spend a few minutes here just digging into the, the two paintings in a bit more detail. And I'm, I'm gonna highlight some of the details and the, some of the storylines that I find the most compelling and was part of my uh, education, frankly, in, in working on this project with Kent and his team. Um, again, this is welcoming the newcomers, which as Kent said, is basically a, a revisioning of the um, first waves, <laughs> pun intended, I guess, waves of, um, of colonization uh, in um, uh, North America. Uh, so you see a range of figures who are sort of personifying uh, larger numbers of figures. You know, he works with the language of personification uh, in a tradition of, of history painting. So, so the, you know, the one uh, African figure uh, in shackles is, of course, a, a personification of the institution of slavery washing up um, as one consequence of, um, of colonization. Uh, you see the French, uh, the Spanish, uh, you see Catholicism uh, coming uh, into uh, what we become now known as New France. And also, if you can look really closely, there are these rats scurrying around um, throughout. And um, they are, of course, um, um, kind of poignant uh, uh, symbols of one of the most devastating um, aspects of colonization, which, of course, is the spread of measles among indigenous people uh, and the death of, um, of so, so many uh, due to the lack of immune uh, from measles. And that actually comes into play here, uh, uh, as you'll see. So the both works are, 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 are embedded with multiple references to works in the Mets collection. As Kent said, many of those works have to do with uh, representations of indigenous people by settler artists. Uh, by European and American artists, I guess, uh, both paintings and sculptures. Um, uh, on the far left of this panel, if you see the seated figure uh, with the, the red feathered plume uh, head um, dress, that's a reference to the Hiawatha sculpture, the Augustus St. Gaudens sculpture that Miss Chief was uh, engaging with in, in the video uh, early on. Um, and uh, references uh, throughout the Mets collection uh, well and beyond that. So we're just gonna take a look at some of these references and, and talk a little bit about why Kent gravitated to them. So he actually gravitated uh, to two uh, representations of Venus and Adonis, one by Titian, which is this one, and one by Rubens. So the couple engaged in the foreground or really in the center of welcoming the newcomers is a an indigenous recapitulation of the, the classic um, uh, Greek um, uh, story of Venus and Adonis. And um, I mean, he fundamentally loves old master painting to begin with, but this subject is of interest to him because uh, Adonis is leaving to go on a hunt, uh, which as you may know, did, doesn't go so well for him, which is one of the reasons v Venus is imploring him to, to stay, which he doesn't because he's a typical man, I guess. Um, so anyway, but uh, so Kent again is making, uh, creating an indigenous Venus and Adonis um, uh, God and a demigod uh, to, to, so that they register uh, really on that same mythic plane. Uh, you, can't, you don't see here, but her back is, uh, has detail of the most beautiful uh, tattooing um, uh, from, uh, from the, uh, which um, the details that Kent has provided here and his team are all based on very intensive research uh, and uh, based on authentic models, um, which of course is also part of his corrective project is because so much of the work he's engaging with is wildly imaginative and misrepresenting indigenous costume, um, et cetera. Oh, and just to say too, that the theme of the hunt is meaningful to Kent too, because it relates to the early economy between, uh, between Europe and um, North America it's, and the economies between indigenous people and uh, colonizers themselves for um, pelts. Uh, and in fact, there's a cute beaver that appears and beaver pelts were, were really currency. So this is a really harrowing um, adaptation of a painting 
by Delacroix in the Metz collection, uh, which you see on the right, uh, Delacroix's, Eugene, Eugene Delacroix's The Natchez, which is a story based on, or drawn from a novel by Chateaubriand. Um, and the narrative here, which again is very grim, which is why the camp value of Kent's work is, is a, an almost necessity because the, the work otherwise is, is very, very dark. Um, but the story of the Natchez is that this couple has given birth to a, a baby that you see here that is um, Im immediately begins to, to die. And that is because the mother's milk won't sustain it because she herself is so filled with misery over the inevitable uh, demise of her people. So um, this is again, a classic example of this trope of the vanishing race that cut across European and American art um, and so part of Kent's project is to engage with these painful works, but it flipped them. So they're about life, not death. So in Kent's work, which you see on the left, on the, de uh, the detail on the left of welcoming the newcomers is that this couple now has um, given birth, but to, but to a very happy, healthy, safe and protected child. And they themselves are, are not um, diminished, diminishing. Um, this too was part of my education about, um, the, about Canada, ca Canadian history, which has, you know, bearing here as well throughout North America, which is, um, so what he's done here is he's making reference to this, uh, Gustave Courbet nude, um, in the uh, 19th century galleries. And as I mentioned, you know, he really loves the language of history painting, but also as part of that the um, technique of, of personification. So using one figure to represent something much larger, uh, a larger idea or phenomenon. In this instance, uh, she is meant to represent what was known or even now is known as a king's girl, a field de roy, and excuse my terrible French, field de roy, um, which um, Louis XIV um, exported, uh, this is very hand, Handmaid's Tale um, um, material, exported uh, young, um, young French women, many of whom were poor and orphans, uh, exported them to um, New France to populate New France. And they were wildly, this technique was wildly successful to the point that I think upwards of a third of ca Canadian citizens today even trace their lineage back to one of these king's girls. And then usually there's, there's no you know, step beyond going back in time for, for family history um, for that reason. So she represents a king's girl um, that is also washing up on, on the shores of what would become New France um, here. Uh, this is one of the most harrowing uh, details, but again, of course, there's this sort of beautiful, poignant um, uh, relationship between the difficulty of some of his imagery, but how beautifully it's manifested in painting. Um, so this is a, another uh, reference to, uh, in this case, the Rubens, Venus and Adonis. I, didn't, I don't have the Rubens um, as a comparative here. But again, another iteration of um, Venus and Adonis. And here's where you see that cute, um, that cute beaver. This is, this is again, where Kent's sense of humor comes out because in an old master uh, painting like this, uh, especially the one by Rubens, you would have like Cupid, uh, right? Uh, as, a, as a symbol of love there. But instead of Cupid in Kent's work, uh, you get this uh, big kind of cute beaver, which again is a reference to this, um, the, um, the economy uh, and uh, economic relations between indigenous com communities and the, the settlers, the colonizers. And this is a couple that you can probably discern is uh, consists of an indigenous woman and this blonde uh, European, you can see with his uh, blue jeans, his um, dungarees or what, whatever you'd call them, engaged uh, as Venus and Donna. So he's making reference there, of course, to um, interracial inter, um, uh, uh, inter relationships that developed between indigenous um, people and uh, colonizers. Um, but it's also, he's also making a reference to something else which you can't quite make out in the image. And it's even lost a little bit in the Great Hall because it's very fine. Um, so um, 
her likeness is based on this portrait in the American Wing by the American portrait painter Henry Inman. So uh, he again studied the collection, and this is you know him deep deep diving into the collection uh, and making uh, reference to this uh, portrait of Eagle of Delight by Henry Inman. And Kent and his team, who are you know very devoted to the research of of the of their work, uh, learn that. Um, as you might, well, you wouldn't expect, but they de determined that unfortunately she did subsequently succumb to the measles plague. And so they are actually painting her likeness here, but uh, she is covered with measles. Um, and that's really why she's distraught. Um, and because she doesn't understand what's happening to her and she's uh, terrified. And you know, if you detect a little bit of hesitation on his part, uh, that may also be the case. So. Uh, it's, um, you know, this, this is some pretty tough stuff, um, but really, again, telling the history of, of North American, um, an early North American history through, through the lens of an indigenous perspective in a very grand, powerful way. Um, and Mystic Osawak, uh, the commission's title, as Kent mentioned, is a Cree word for um, wooden boat people. Uh, well, it translates from the Cree to wooden boat people, which was basically what they, um, what Cree, uh, Cree people call, referred to the French, uh, who came over on wooden boats, and you can see some of them here not being, uh, not being so successful at this moment. You can see one of those little rats uh, on the, the boat to the left, and, you know, nice little nod to Winslow Homer uh, with the, with the, um, uh, with the, um, the other, the painting by Wins Winslow Homer, its title is out of my head at the second, but um, in the Mets collection. Um, so, but the Mystic Walk really then became a, a reference to all types of, of European colonization, not just the French. So um, I'm just checking in on time. Um, so this is the second picture, um, uh, Resurgence of the People, where, um, Mischief, uh, whereas Mischief was uh, helping assist um, uh, people washing up on the shores um, in the first painting. Here, Mischief is shown, again, taking the place of Washington in Washington Crossing the Delaware, the iconic work in the Mets collection, as, um, as a, an uh, emblem, as a kind of personification of resilience, uh, which is really what this picture is about, resilience under uh, and against terrible odds. Um, and um, let's see, I think I have a few. Yeah, of course, the, the clear reference here is to Washington crossing the Delaware. Um, and, you know, just um, a work that has been presumed to sort of retell a, hist a historical narrative in a, in a factual way, which, which of course, it's, it's highly not. Um, um, but the details here, again, just like the other picture, like spectacular. Um, and many of the figures in this painting are people in Kent's life, uh, uh, including, I think I have, so this is uh, a recapitulation of, of one of the paintings that was shown in the promo video of uh, this family unit. Uh, this uh, depiction of um, mothers with their children is also an, a, a reference to the Canadian school system. I talked about before, which tore these families apart. Uh, and so again, so Kent's mission is in a way in his art to reunite families. And in this case, the, the likeness of the little kid flipping over backwards uh, in the gray sweater is Kent's godson. So this, this is a very personal, um, especially very personal painting for him. Um, and just as a way of finishing up and opening up for a bit of Q&A and discussion, I hope, just uh, there are references and resources online that we created for the, the exhibition that I hope you might seek out, including this long article, which goes into a bit more detail than I have time to tonight, of uh, Kent Monkman reverses art history's colonial gaze. Um, and, and I'm just ever uh, perpetually gratified for the public reception of this work, um, which again, this was a little bit daring for the Mets uh, perspective. Uh, I mean, early on, there was some concern about, you know, the, the nudity in the Great Hall, a kind of a public space. Ostensibly, you don't have to pay anything to come into the Great Hall. Uh, and interestingly, there was never really any dust up about um, all the nudity, which, of course, was all coming from the Mets collection at any rate. Uh, 
but this is just a cross section of some of the, uh, you know, the, the mainstream like New York Times article were, the reviews were all were, were great, but even more gratifying to me in a way was, was the way this registered in social media where, um, where indigenous and black people uh, coming uh, in, you know, registered their, their um, excitement and seeing them represented in this symbolic space for the first time. And in this kind of context that uh, really takes on issues of white supremacy and colonization in a place like the Met of no, um, to, to, to boot. Um, so with that, I think um, I, I think we have a bit. Of, I know that we have sort of a hard stop, maybe at six, but we we do have time. Yes, for sort of for some questions. Great, thank you, Randy. Um, we have at least one. I invite um, anyone who has a question uh, for our speaker to raise your hand, or um, if you you want to pop something in the chat, I'll I'll pose the question myself, but you're also um, welcome to raise your hand or, you know, indicate that you would like to ask a question in the chat and I can call on you and you can ask your question, you know, with your face and voice. So we have a question from Rhonda about um, what is the symbolism of the high heels? Oh, yeah, I'm sorry I skipped that. It's a fairly obvious um, detail. Those, uh, those are very, dis I mean, I know next to nothing about hot couture. So, you know, the, I had to learn this too. Um, but those are distinctive, like the, the red, um, on the under, the red under the shoe is, a is a, a signifier of a very fancy French brand of shoe called Christian Louboutin. Um, and so in a way it, it's highlighting mischief, uh, in a kind of camp sit, like the, she has proximity to, to, um, contemporary culture that she's time traveling, uh, across time. But also, I guess she likes nice time. She likes nice things. But it's also the fact that it's a, a French brand also is folded into this longer historical kind of dialectic between the French and the indigenous people of North America. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. I, I had to learn that bit myself. Great. It also seems to be like this playing with gender too yeah. that he was talking about in one of the right. videos that you showed. Yeah, exactly. It's it 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 serve, it works in that way because in, it's um yeah as Kent said in the video that mischief is a creation out of the longer tradition of a non-binary, uh, two spirited, uh, indigenous person who was often uh, exalted in in the in indigenous communities mm -hmm. and also ran very much uh, uh, against. A kind of European model of your man or woman and your, you know, that thing. So, um, Donna has a question. Um, Many of the white people are truly stark white. She says, "Is that to emphasize the difference with the native peoples depicted here?" I mean, that's that's a really good call. I mean, that's it's uh, the figure, the white figures who are white do stand out distinctly as white. So yes, especially that that blonde guy, right, is. And so I think there is a, an intent to highlight difference, but there are um, references to mix, mix race mix, mixing, of course, throughout as well, uh, and a more of a spectrum of skin color. Uh, I just didn't, um, I guess, didn't happen not to, to show those in detail. I think it's interesting following up on Donna's question. It seems really interesting that, you know, one of the things you were talking about is how he's trying to flip these other depictions of indigenous people as sickly or fading away. And actually, to me, the, the white figures in the paintings are the ones who look sickly. Um, well, which you know, and, and one detail I didn't, one detail I, you know, didn't show, uh, but the upper left hand corner of, and it's not about being sickly, but it's about being morally sick. And that the figures in the upper left hand corner of resurgence of the people you may have noticed are, uh, so the, 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 the water levels are rising in that second painting due to global warming and you can tell the water is brackish compared to the water in um, in welcoming the newcomers but in a little um, uh, a little piece of land that is quickly diminishing is a scary group of white supremacists mm -hmm. and and so um, uh, so that that's also part of this um, this critique um, and, and that white kind of white supremacy is being a, a legacy of early colonial history. Mm -hmm. Um, we had a couple of questions about the fate of these paintings. Um, is this going to be permanently on display in the Great Hall? Um, well, um, I, again, I'm glad that came up because, um, yeah, people are always curious of like about what's next. Um, 
So um, we were meant to close um, the commission, as I mentioned, in April. Um, and then, of course, the museum itself was closed until the end of August. So when we reopened, um, we reopened with the Great Hall Commission still in place. And I was happy about that. Um, and um, uh, and I, we started working on acquiring them. Um, and so they are collection objects now, um, which is also great. Um, and um, we started conversations with the Montreal Muse Museum of Fine Arts, and, uh, Museum of Fine Arts in Montreal, uh, which is very keen to show Kent's work. And they have great work by Kent in the collection already, but they're a bit of a standard bearer since Kent has become, you know, such a rock star for Canadian art generally. Um, and, uh, and so we have been in conversation about lending them because um, there are other commissions kind of in queue for the Great Hall. And so they can't stay there indefinitely. And we aren't quite ready to show them anywhere else. We don't quite, we, that's gonna take some planning. It's like, where do we show them in the wing, uh, in, the, in the modern contemporary art wing? Uh, we just need time to plan for that. Um, and so we were happy to, especially given how <laughs> cultural relations, national relations have been between Canada and the US of late, you know, we even started thinking of extending these as, as a, a kind of quasi diplomatic act um, between the two countries. Um, but um, uh, the Montreal Museum shut down again. Uh, so it's on that loan is on hold, um, at least until spring. So they're gonna be the upshot, which I'm happy about again, is that they will remain on view in the Great Hall through um, the spring into March at least. So I do hope that any, anyone tuning in here who hasn't seen them in person, that maybe gives an opportunity to see them. Amy has a, another question about the, um, about the paintings and the acquisition themselves. Um, she's curious what you can tell us about the de deliberations around acquiring these pieces for the permanent collection. What was your pitch and were there any votes against? Um, that's also a great question. You know, these, those situations can be, um, as you know, um, complicated and, and take a while. Um, no, I think um, the, the argument was actually pretty easy to make, to be honest, in this instance. It's, it's not often. But I think uh, the institutional leadership just recognized what, what this project meant for the institution uh, and under this larger, and of course now that in, now of course the Met has, like other institutions made public statements about D, uh, um, you know, especially in solidarity with um, uh, African-American citizens, but also, you know, a renewed commitment uh, under, you know, um, this new uh, renewed calls for social justice. And frankly, the Met taking a look at its own colonial history, that that that, that this project just really hit so many um, right marks for us, and the impact uh, was such that that we really should not let that let them come and go. You know, we 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 and we can't be instrumentalizing um, black um, artists, indigenous artists. We can't be instrumentalizing them to show their work for you know three or four months and then just let let it pass like it's window dressing. We have to demonstrate. A, a real commitment to it by bringing works into the collection. So it actually that under the circumstances, which of course are circumstances none of us would desire or predict, um, uh, it, the case was pretty easily made. And the other element there was the funding, which came from the Sobe Foundation in Canada, uh, which is one of the biggest philanthropic organizations in Canada. Uh, and uh, Donald Sobe is a big uh, patron of Kent's and really wanted to see Kent's work land permanently in the Met's collection. So uh, uh, luckily we, we had funding for it from outside because of course it's, it's a tricky time to be making big acquisitions as you know, in a moment where museums have laid people off. But in this case, you know, we, we had a promise gift to underwrite it. Great, there's actually um, a perfect follow-up question to this from Sydney. Um, does the Met have plans for acquiring, acquiring more works by contemporary indigenous artists? Um, I mean, I don't know what, what my colleagues might have um, brewing, um, but we're certainly, um, well, also, I mean, in addition to that, I'd say that you know, the Met, as you may have read, um, hired its first native curator in the American wing, um, Patricia Norby, which is a great, um, uh, sign of change. Um, and so these issues permeate not only um, the collection, but, you know, staffing 
uh, as well. And um, so, yeah, and I think that also, we, you know, we do have more work by indigenous modern contemporary artists in the collection than, than we often show. So I think part of the equation too, part of the solution is showing more of the work that we have. Um, and, but none of that work is anything like, you know, the kind of work that, that Kent does that is so engaged in the history of art. We had a question from Donna about the military figures in the second painting and what they signify. Uh, well, it's a range of militarized figures and including one figure that uh, has NYPD emblazoned across his chest. Uh, and I, I think that's the detail that caused um, the, <laughs> the fifth floor of the Met the most worry. Um, um, and of course we have um, patrol out on Fifth Avenue from, you know, a, a unit of the NYPD. So that, that detail was, um, so that those figures carry over to some extent from other work that Kent did, did a, a few, well, over the last few years about the conflicts uh, around Standing, uh, uh, Standing Rock um, and the, the battles over land rights, uh, which of course also resonate uh, in Canada, but he, he's made work about these amazing paintings about the the, you know, the standoffs and, and the, the skirmishes between indigenous people here in the US and, and at Standing Rock with, with police. So, um, and again, you know, in the wake of George Floyd's murder and Breonna Taylor and all of that, I mean, his, um, his um, you know, um, call out to uh, racialized violence in this, in this work just becomes all the more prescient, uh, regrettably. Kathy was curious how long the entire project took um, and are you also acquiring the preparatory drawings and photographs as part of the, um, as part of what the Met is acquiring? Um, that is a great question. And I'm sorry, I didn't fold that into the um, introduction, but um, Kent and his team turned this, turned these around from in nine months. So he stopped everything he was doing um, and everything all of his studio members were doing uh, to work solely on this. So from our approach to preliminary drawings, which um, he actually proposed originally um, a different concept that was a little more closely tied to the standing rock imagery that I mentioned. Um, but we really wanted him to delve into the next collection. So we um, gave him some feedback and he went a different, I mean, obviously a different direction. So, but so from initial approach to delivery was nine months, which is incredible. Um, uh, so, yeah. Um, and what was the other part of that question? I was whether the preparatory sketches and other materials oh. are also part of what you're acquiring. Uh, we have digital files of the photographs he took uh, for documentary purposes. Um, we have not acquired uh, and I don't think we plan to acquire the studies because frankly, he's finding other buyers for those. Uh, I mean, Kent's, you know, like, you know, like many of our, so, so many great artists are not also quite smart for business, but you know, there's an economic uh, consideration built into doing those smaller scale works because uh, they become desirable for domestic settings uh, and as a connection to the, the final large work. Um, and so I know that um, the two um, medium size or you know easel sized works that you see him working on in one of those videos, those have already sold to to a private collector. So you know he's bright, and but he he has a lot of people to support. And I think that um, unless something changed at some point, you know even under COVID and shutdown and economic, he held on to all of his studio uh, members. And I think that the payday he received um, when the Met acquired uh, the work through the Sobe Foundation um, helped to sustain uh, a, a lot of people working in his studio. Great, thank you. We just have a couple more questions here. Um, Chris was curious if you could say a bit more about the context for the, the first video that you showed. Um, I think the one depicting uh, Miss Chief, him dressed up as Miss Chief. Um, was that a work of performance art that uh, he also did in the museum? Yeah, I'm. Thanks for that question too, because Kent, you know, Kent doesn't necessarily only think of himself as a painter. He's worked in installation. He's worked, you know, and he has this performative element as Miss Chief. And 
yeah, the, the very memorable um, raucous opening of the, of the commission that night uh, which was packed in the big auditorium, people named, you know, that overflowed, in fact, um, was Mischief, perform reading from Mischief's um, autobiography, which will come out this year, where, you know, she uh, talks about, um, you know, moving through time and space. And, um, you know, she's de she decolonizes uh, history through love. So she has these passionate affairs with, you know, people like um, uh, John, John Mick Stanley, who was a, you know one of the Indian painters, um, you know even has um, relations with uh, folks like Andrew Jackson, you know. So she is uh, she again her, her she herself is a kind of Venus figure, um, who in this case decolonizes through through love and sex. So some of Kent's work gets pretty explicit, you know. So um, you know here we had to ne we negotiated with him a bit about you know levels of appropriateness for the great hall where and kids are coming through and stuff but um, but he's really you know um, very um, easy to work with uh, around that, those issues um, I, I think an appropriate closing question from Shelby how does the Met continue plan to continue highlighting indigenous voices and other marginalized narratives well um, I mean that's a great question and again I don't have I don't have, you know, I, I usually resist like projecting into the future um, too much because, you know, things always change. But, but, um, but by virtue of the Diker collection in the American wing and the activities and curatorial initiatives of uh, Patricia Norby, you know, there will be, um, um, you know, uh, ongoing engagement with that, the, with that body of work, but also those are opportunities to uh, extend those narratives into the, uh, the the contemporary time that we're in, uh, and so I'm sure that you know this is where I wish Patricia were on the call for me because you know she she will pick up the reins because she's not just necessarily tucked away in the American wing dealing with like historic uh, art. Uh, she's going to be very much engaged with uh, indigenous communities, uh, and contemporary uh, indigenous artists, and you know I'm sure there'll be a lot of um, collaboration between modern and contemporary and Patricia in the American wing. Um, moving forward. So um, yeah, it's, it's, um, it's something that it's, it's just going to be baked more into the cake that is the Met, uh, more than it has been before, for sure. Thank you so much. Um, Becky, uh, if you're still with us, um, do you have anything you want to say in closing? I appreciate that, Amaris. I apologize. My video is off. Um, okay. Like many of you, I'm in my sweatpants already <laughs> uh, enjoying the lecture. But I did just want to offer uh, that this has been such a fabulous opportunity to learn more about this piece and really to get us thinking in some new directions. So Randy, I just want to thank you for giving us such an insightful hour here together. It's been just riveting. Um, I also wanted to take the opportunity as we close here to remind everyone, uh, if you did not know, uh, to share that today we opened our new exhibition at the museum. It's entitled Expanding Horizons, Celebrating 20 Years of the Hartford Steam Boiler Collection. Oh. And it's a wonderful opportunity for us to be looking at the transformative gift from the Hartford Steam Boiler Collection that was received 20 years ago. And uh, it's really a collaboration with 20 scholars from a variety of fields and perspectives responding to the collection and providing new scholarship on it. So that's a wonderful show that we really hope you'll be able to join us for. Um, so again, thank you, Randy. We, this is another wonderful addition to our library of incredible Samuel Thorne lectures. And because of this recording, we will be able to save it for posterity. So thank you so much to Amaris and CLHO for partnering with us on this to make the, uh, the Zoom possible. And I just wanted to thank everyone for joining us as well. Oh, uh, thank thank you. you for the invitation. Perfect. All right. On that note, I think we will close everything. Amaris, if you want to shut down the recording. Perfect. And thanks everyone for joining us. Have a wonderful evening. Thank you all.